What does it really take to get your service design ideas implemented so that you can show the true impact of your work? That's what you'll learn in this episode. Here's the guest for this episode. Let the show begin. Hi, this is Simon Mahana and this is the Service Design Show. Hi, I'm Mark and welcome to the Service Design Show. This show is all about helping you to build organizations that put people at the heart of their business. The guest in this episode is Simon Mahana. Simon is an innovation designer at The Moment, which is a design agency based in Toronto. The reason I'm so excited to have Simon on the show is that he recently wrote a piece titled Service Design is Not Enough. Once I got over the clickbaity title and actually read the piece in depth, Simon makes some really good arguments uh, and questions if we as a service design community aren't biting um, a piece that is too big to chew for us. So at the end of this episode, you'll know if we need to do less and be more focused to actually create more impact. That's all for the intro. And now let's quickly jump into the chat with Simon. Welcome to the show, Simon. Hi, Mark. Good to have you on. Uh, in the introduction, I already uh, gave a short sort of hint on why we are chatting. It's also because the article that you wrote on service design, it's not enough. We'll get there. But for the people who haven't read the article or who don't know who you are, could you give like a really brief introduction? Sure. Um, so I'm Simon Mahana. I'm an innovation designer at The Moment. Uh, the Moment is an innovation consultancy uh, firm based in Toronto. Um, the practice basically that we, we do includes um, different aspects of innovation and service design as a core uh, principle or core aspect of uh, the practice that we do. And this was kind of the context in which I uh, was reflecting on where the practice is and um, how it looks or it feels like to be a service designer in, in Toronto and what um, the market, where the market is at. And this is what uh, the reason I wrote the article about service design is not enough. Uh, and I'm happy to kind of uh, dive a little bit deeper into that with you today. Yeah. <clears throat> it, when I first saw it, I, uh, I think one of your colleagues, uh, hinted me up on that direction. I was like, who is this guy? And what is this clickbaity uh, title? And then I read the article and uh, you actually have some pretty good points. I'm like sure to link to the article uh, down below so people can form their own opinions and we'll talk about the topics uh, today. Simon, the question I ask everybody, your first encounter with service design, what was that? Uh, it goes back in time. I um Believe I think my my first um, kind of when I started dabbling in service design, it was more from a my passion for the design process overall. Uh, when I so just kind of giving you a sense of where I come from in terms of like uh, educational background. So I graduated as uh, from design school. I quickly learned that design in the context it was a few years back was not necessarily what I had in mind for design. Uh, it was like really uh, placed in a tiny box that uh, I had more ambition for what I wanted to do as a designer. So I quickly learned for credibility purposes that I needed to go in other areas to kind of get that piece of paper that give me permission to be uh, at the table where key decisions are being made. So I went into my uh, first master's degree and I did a uh, studies in media and communications. And after that, I ended up going to business school uh, because the business and the strategic aspect was also what I realized needed to uh, be able to join the conversations at a key and critical moments of the work. So, um, and that gave me the opportunity to start doing some work. Back then, I would think it was more in the like branding and experience design, I would say. Uh, but also it started teaching and bringing more the business mindset into uh, some design courses. And that sparked my interest in understanding better the design process and how it applies to uh, solve business problems. And that was, I would say, the early, um, uh, the early start of design thinking. 
Uh, we didn't call it design thinking back then. We didn't really have a name for it. Uh, I also had good kind of friends in kind of the social sciences space who were also kind of started to be interested in, in uh, design. So it was kind of that time where human-centered design was kind of also starting and there was a lot of confusion back then. It was, what is it's, uh, there is design. still a lot of confusion. <laughs> and it continues, yeah. And, and this is also like where I'm a bit concerned now about service design, but, uh, and we'll talk about that. But uh, I think, yeah, what allowed me in a way to uh, really use my academic platform to do some research and start publishing a few articles around uh, how the kind of the cognitive skills with the mindful kind of uh, thinking can really be embedded in the design process to understand the uh, business challenge, but also understand the people and really enable people to collaborate together. And I had the opportunity to work um, with engineers and lawyers and people who don't speak the language of design to uh, really experiment and test some frameworks early on. Uh, and then I got the opportunity to work with uh, some, um, I would say, like European designers, where I think in Germany and in Italy and uh, in Amsterdam and other places where service design are start was starting to kind of come together. And uh, there are a few programs like in the Netherlands and like they started using that language. And I was in, in Lebanon, in Beirut, and I had the opportunity to collaborate with a few of them on some projects in the not-for-profit space, uh, which kind of helped me also kind of build that language around it. And when I moved to Canada about six years ago, uh, I presented myself as a service designer, yeah. and that was like very intriguing for people, but also they didn't know what to do with it. And I would say my recollection of events is people would say, this is interesting, it's happening in the US, they knew IDEO, they knew those other firms, but uh, the, the understanding of it and the application of it was not fully adopted in Canada. And this is where I met the moment. Uh, and we started using that language and we worked with uh, big corporations in the service space, like from financial uh, institutions to telcos, uh, to healthcare, uh, to actually build that uh, capability within uh, their groups. And really quickly after that, the landscape changed and there was a lot of uptake and a lot of excitement uh, about service design here in Toronto. Hmm. And um, now we feel in a place where we don't really need to define what service design is, but I think we are finding challenges in like framing the work and presenting the work in a way that people um, can make the most of it. Right. I guess it's no coincidence that the uh, <clears throat> global conference was in Toronto this year and that I think in the, from the last 10 episodes of the show, five people were from Canada. So uh, uh, it's good to see that the that, uh, field is maturing uh, across uh, the other side of the ocean. Simon, you gave me some really interesting topics uh, about things related to service design is not enough. Are you ready to jump in and do some interview jazz? I'm ready, Mark. Are you? <laughs> I am. <laughs> well, yeah, I am. Definitely. Let's do this. So topic number one is going to be called embedding ideas. Okay. I'm going to go with, um, I'm going to go with the why. And it's a simple question of like, why are we having challenges of really embedding uh, the service design work in uh, the organizations that uh, we are working for or that we're working within? That's a really good question. Uh, <clears throat> I have some ideas about it, but I'd love to hear what your take is. Um, yeah, so I think we hinted a little bit about um, kind of the, the article that I wrote. And I think the major point that I was trying to make uh, behind, behind that article is that there's a lot of excitement about service design, which is great. Uh, there, are, there, is a, there is a big appetite to do service design work. And uh, we've been working with 
a lot of uh, like on a, a lot of interesting projects with various uh, organizations in different industries. Uh, the challenge that we are facing is that uh, once we in, in, engage in that work and we start working uh, together, uh, especially like with the moment because we have this uh, kind of what we call joined up team, which is an approach where we really collaborate uh, closely with the teams within the organization to do the work. Uh, we are realizing that it's, it's in some contexts and some organizations we bump into some barriers. Uh, and these are quite risky if uh, there is no awareness and there is no uh, parallel work that is happening in the organization to enable uh, the work not only to happen, but all, also to go further into the implementation and into the rollout. Uh, so what, what and, kind of... You know, what kind of barriers and what is the risk? So the risk that we see is that um, sometimes people don't really understand the why service design. So they, they know there is something that they can do better. They, they engage without understanding the implications and what the service design work can reveal. Uh, the other aspect I would say is the organization readiness to make the shift that the service design work will require. So well, what uh, kind of shift? Shift, I would say, the shift in, in, in behaviors, shift in mindsets, uh, shifts even on a strategic level in the direction that the organization is going. Uh, the great value of the service design work is that it's applied, it's tangible, it shows people what it is and what it should be, and it gives them the roadmap to get there. But beyond that, there is a lot of work that is required by the organization to bring the people uh, kind of um, on board, bring the leadership team on board and uh, really put that uh, service design work in the strategic context for the organization. And when we work on with people, on people, and we work on, with the leadership uh, teams, then I think we're really talking about the transformational work that needs to happen. We talk about culture, we talk about infrastructure, um, all of these other aspects that um, people don't, are, don't necessarily have awareness uh, of when they sign on like a project a, a project in, in service design. Yeah, so <clears throat> how do you approach this? Because when a client uh, comes up with a brief and you uh, create a proposal, usually they when they don't know what they don't know they don't include like this transformational part in the project brief what is your approach then how do you do, do you just reject the client do you help them to reformulate the brief what do you do um okay so uh, this is like an interesting question and this is something that we talk a lot of, a lot about in our practice and in, in, in our studio uh, I think there are different types of clients. There are people who uh, come to us with some level of understanding of the implications. They have the right intentions in place. Uh, and you can have this conversation early on with them. You can uh, set some conditions uh, for the work to happen. Uh, but in other cases, like knowing that um, the other transformational work is quite complex, it takes time, it's a big investment for the organization. Sometimes it's, it's a bit scary to kind of talk about it um, right off the top of the project. So if we sense that there is like the right mindsets are there, the right people are there, uh, we find it usually useful to actually start doing the work and then make the case for it. Right. Uh, it. It gets like really like hairy and complex if you start talking about these things uh, without really putting them in uh, the right context for the organization and the work, uh, the project work really reveals uh, what it really looks like for the organization. And you can then in a very tangible and clear way surface those barriers, talk about the challenges and create the case for uh, the innovation shift right. or the innovation, the transformation. Yeah. <clears throat> so, so <clears throat> and that is quite an interesting uh, approach because sometimes you need a first project to 
sort of fail to show where the roadblocks are and to and you know you'll know up front that it won't uh, go as far as you might want want it to go but you just need to put it out there so that the client sees the roadblocks for themselves right and then you have to pray for the chance to do it <laughs> to to get a second try uh, yeah, because obviously failure is still like a big, uh, a big taboo in in, the, in, in this space. So uh, people like really go out of their way to make it look like it worked no matter what, even if it's like a tiny incremental outcome, they want to tell a success story. Uh, so you really need to hold people accountable to what they've set as uh, their goals from the beginning. And uh, it requires, like, I would say, it's it's not a, it's not easy, right? So it's it's uh, like we have a lot of empathy for people who uh, are taking on those challenges in their organizations, and we know it's not something that they can change overnight. So it is a lot of work, and we 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 are there to support them, but we really need to create a space where we can have an honest and open conversation around it. Uh, and I think this is like the most critical condition. Hmm. Uh, for to set the organization to like really succeed, if it's for, like yeah. field based, if it's like there's a lot of um, politics and things that are happening around the work, it really limits the potential of the work. And um, and also like I would think our approach makes it a bit easier because we tend to like work on multiple projects, so we want to help also the organization achieve their immediate short term goals. Uh, we don't want them to like hold them back and then say, hey, there's a lot of other things that we need to do before we can really move the work forward. So we do it, but I think uh, we help them kind of achieve their immediate needs. But at the same time, uh, we carve out the space to talk about the strategic level and the bigger shifts that also are needed to get them not only to stay relevant short term in the market, but really to like figure out what the future of the organization really looks like. Right. So <clears throat> what I hear you say, and uh, it, it has also been restated by your Canadian colleague, Sarah Shulman, in the previous episode, like the relationship you have with a client determines a lot, a lot about what you can do as a service designer. So if, if people haven't seen the previous episode, uh, check it out with Sarah Shulman. Um, Simon, topic yes. number two. Uh, because you already mentioned uh, a lot of uh, the work that needs to be done internally. So this topic makes a lot of sense because it's called internal skills. Okay, Which so question starter would you with, pick? I'm going to go with how can. How, how can, can we? The designer's favorite. So, yeah. Yeah. So I think it's how can we... Um, I'm going to say, how can we like build the skills within the organizations to sustain uh, the service design work and the innovation work? Hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, and I think my take on this is that it's through the work, right? So <laughs> this kind of reiterates the uh, what I just said earlier about the importance of taking on real challenges, taking on uh, projects with clear goals and clear conditions and really using the projects as a way to probe into uh, what the, con the organization is capable of and uh, putting on um, the learner mindset, I would say, and be humble in saying, this is what we can achieve. These are the gaps that we have um, and creating a kind of, what we call a kind of a learning program in a way where uh, we really assess the capabilities and assess uh, the, the the organization readiness at multi like at multiple points through uh, the work to see what's evolving, what's changing, and what's not, and having those kind of reflective moments as part of the process to see uh, what did we learn, what else do we want to learn. Um, and have strategic conversations later on in terms of like what other projects we need to take on, uh, what capabilities do we have, but also what capabilities do we need to acquire or invest in building. And um, 
do you uh, are those reflective moments part of a project or is it like a parallel track um i would say both so uh the project work uh as, as you said because it's it's applied it's, it pushes the organization to to show up mm -hmm. and in those moments you are able to see if um like the practitioners the people within within the organization have what they need or not and sometimes it's a matter of like actual experience or like the skills uh sometimes it's a matter of like tools uh but i would say often it's it's a matter of permission right so right. we talk about permission so we talked about failure we talked about um um the, the, the culture and i think this is where if people are approaching the work with fear if people are approaching the work with like specific goals that they need to hit no matter what insights or what learnings come up out of out of the research and out of the work um like these are signals that the organization context is not ready to do actual innovation work so like uh what you just said that, that aren't specifically the skills so if we focus on skills for a second like what would be like your top three regarding skills that people within an organization need to acquire to actually get this to the next level rather than permission and fear the, the rather than the culture stuff right um i would say um leadership skills uh and i know like this is like maybe it builds on exactly what we we're just saying but a big aspect of the work is really uh creating a uh a momentum within the organization uh creating buy-in uh holding people um accountable to what they said they wanted to do and have hard conversations so this uh, this ability to like coach and support people through uh, this work is important and it is a key capability i would say it's a key skill um, that is also evolving and changing in terms of like the nature of it and the the types of tactics and strategies that are needed to uh, like actually practice it and put it in place uh, i would say another one would be um, so this will sound a little bit funny, but I think it's a, like the applied design capability, which rather than the design thinking, people. yeah, yeah. So it's about really rolling out your sleeves and getting into like the 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 quick and dirty aspect of of, of this work of like really prototyping quickly, talking to people quickly. Uh, we see organizations like ten, like who tend to sit back have like lots of long conversations, a lot of meetings, a lot of, uh, they, they dream about things and they decide on things without, uh, and they make like big decisions in terms of investment of resources and stuff without even like trying anything. Hmm. Uh, so I think the design capability of like really taking quickly an idea and running quickly with it to test it and kind of sense of um, what, the customers want what the stakeholders want and like really understanding this in a more tangible way i would say i would say it is a, a key skill that um, not a lot of organizations invest in hmm. uh, having like designers uh, and designers who are trained in i would say the classic aspect of design the craft uh, yeah yeah it is a craft and the last one, I would say it's, it's strategic and futures. So strategic thinking and futures. And this is where uh, we see uh, also a lot of organization going in uh, and making those investments or starting projects without stepping back and understanding the why of the project and why of this investment and really building a strong business case uh, so that when we um, we have the outcomes of the service design work. We can reflect back and say, is this the right thing to do or not? Hmm. Um, and this is also like where we see it's a bit hard without that clarity to create that uh, moment in the process where we can really assess and 
make some hard decisions sometimes of saying this is not the right outcome or this was not the right project or not the right idea. And uh, without that strategic lens, I think uh, we don't have the base, we don't have the tools to have those conversations. Hmm. Um, <clears throat> I want to move into topic number three because I think uh, a lot of questions that are on my mind will be answered in this third topic regarding internal skills. And the third topic is called scope. Yes. And, and do you have a question starter? Uh, I think I'm going to go with what if? What if? And the question I think for me is what if service design is not the catch all uh, kind of term or catch all like, practice? Yeah, be uh, yeah, because what you just described, like uh, educating people on leadership, educating people uh, regarding making tough decisions. Is that even our job? Like, shouldn't the organization just uh, know when they hire service designers what, like, what their environment should look like? How far should we go uh, until we're until we lose credibility? Because I think that's a big risk here. Yeah, I think you you flag a, um, a critical I think early on in the conversation where we're talking about design thinking and human centered design and the confusion that we still carry on and 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 live with. And what I'm seeing is also some risk for the service design community to end up um, kind of similar to what where design thinking is now, where we have we kind of try to stretch it to fit everything and then it, it lost its value in a way hmm. and it's not that it's not effective or it doesn't work it's just that we don't know what it is anymore it's diluted it's diluted and it's like especially for people who uh did not like really dive deep into it to understand it it, it became a term that uh we use as a label for everything and uh, therefore, it's hard to kind of track the, the impact or the value of it. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think service design is in that place too. And um, the, the provocation I, I, I wanted to uh, kind of articulate in, in, my, in my article, like uh, out of the uh, service design global conference, is that there's great awareness and understanding of all the adjacent and the parallel streams of work that need to be Done, and we touched on leadership, we touched on organization design, we touched on culture, we touched on right. uh, systems and, and futures. Uh, so all of these things are really important aspect of the innovation work in general, but they don't necessarily need to live under service design. So for me, there is a risk when we say the next evolution of service design is systems thinking and change management and this and that. Uh, because I think it loses the focus and it loses uh, the clarity that it's like really in a crisp now and we've worked hard to get there and if we now start kind of piling everything under the umbrella of service design we're just gonna lose that and lose the credibility lose uh, that momentum that's in the market right now yeah so yeah uh, Go ahead. Well, yeah, I'm thinking about, I, I don't know, trying to come up with an analogy on the spot, like uh, a baker uh, who knows how to uh, create delicious bread. If we would expect him to also be able to build the bakery and build the machines to uh, the ovens to bake the bread, like how, how far it, it, we don't want, we don't want that. Like we don't expect that from a baker. Uh, I, at least I don't. I'm not sure why we are trying to expect this from a service designer. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the thing because also like, it's just like the scope of work becomes so confusing and people's expectations become uh, so broad that it becomes harder to like really demonstrate value. Uh, again, I, like, I'm, I am a service designer in, in, in uh, in, in many ways, it's definitely a core aspect of my practice, and I really believe in the value of it. And I believe that uh, it's kind of the um, 
now that it is understood and valued, there is a great way to really uh, push the organizations into uh, like innovation with a big eye. It's a great way to reveal all of these different aspects, uh, but we don't need necessarily need to take it on as part of the services right. network. Yeah. So <clears throat> we have other like practitioners, we have other practices that are well established to uh, like come on board, collaborate with the service designers to do this critical and important work. And I love the fact that the service design community is like really on it now. And through the service design work, we are able to start having those conversations because I think that would be a great uh, way to open up those conversations within uh, organizations where innovation still scares them uh, when, we, when we talk about transformation or culture change or um, systems, uh, like it's because it's complex, because it takes time, it's hard. People tend to like kind of step back and run away uh, in some cases. I love that the fact that service design is creating the platform for this conversation to happen. Uh, but I would love for the service design work to stay focused on delivering great projects, great, great, uh, like ways of addressing business challenges, uh, while flagging those other issues, but also letting other people kind of come on board and collaborate and do the work. Hmm. It's interesting that I, <clears throat> I'm sort of, uh, seeing two streams within service design uh, emerging, like there is a stream of people who say we don't need new silos, we don't need new boundaries, like, let's not uh, obsess with definitions. Well, there are, the other stream is more uh, people who say, you know, this is a craft, this this has boundaries, it's it makes it easier for people to actually learn what it is it makes it makes it easier for people to buy. Um, it's interesting, and it, and it it seems like the gap is widening between these two communities. Yeah, and and, and I'm not saying that service designers are like they should not be ambitious and and willing to also step out of uh, the service design kind of box to also take on other projects. But I think for me, it's more about the clarity of the language and being clear that this is where. I'm doing service design work, and this is where I'm taking on those additional levels or layers of the organization. And that clarity and uh, is a big aspect of this industry. And we, 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 we look at that, I think, even the way we, um, like, when we make uh, agreements with organizations of what the work is and what the deliverables are, you need that clarity. And it's something that I feel that um, gives people within the organization the language and um, the the tangible aspects that will help them sell the work, position the work clearly within their organizations. Right. Because uh, for people who like still take like who are taking the leap and investing in the service design work and uh, demonstrating leadership by bringing new practices in, in the organization. I think we need to set them up to show the value, set them up to succeed so that they can bring the whole organization on board. And I think if we start like blowing things out of scope and we start kind of adding all of those different layers, it just becomes harder for the organization to buy, harder for the organization to measure. And therefore I think it's gonna start kind of fighting back because it's gonna be all over the place. Hmm. And from that perspective, Simon, is there a question that you'd like to ask the people who are watching and listening to the show right now? Uh, actually, I would be like, I think I'm going to build on your question of where where people stand in terms of this, uh, this kind of those two paths that we're seeing uh, today. And uh, I think my question is really around um, because we see like service design in very different contexts. We see service design uh, being um, like bought as a, uh, a vendor service. We see service design being embedded in the organization. We see service design in the private and the public sector. I think the conversation, the question or the conversation that we need to have next is 
how does it show up really for people in those different contexts and and what aspects I think of this additional layer uh, of work can really be brought under the umbrella of service design and what uh, has to be clearly uh, stated as out of scope. So, which is a very hard kind of line to draw, but I think that's, that would be a nice challenge uh, to get people to kind of weigh in on that. Yeah, well, I, I would be interesting if people can comment with a few examples of projects that uh, sort of call themselves service design projects, but uh, feel clearly out of scope. And if so, why? Like, we need. I think we need practical examples. Um, and this will this will no no doubtly start. Uh, uh, what was the internet meme? Uh, it will start uh, a rage or something like that. Anyway, leave your comments. <laughs> leave your comments in the comments. Simon, uh, if people want to get in touch with you to continue this conversation, what's the best way to do that? Uh, my LinkedIn would be a good place to to to, to connect. Uh, and uh, if people are feeling like they want to put the energy in an email, it's simon at the moment dot is. I'm always happy to uh, also read from people who have questions or even have any responses to any of the provocations that we've put out there today. Awesome. I'll make sure to link uh, to all the relevant resources. So thanks, uh, Simon, for continuing this uh, exploration of what service design is and how we take it to the next levels it was uh, quite interesting. So what is your take? Where does service design stop? Leave a comment down below and I'm really curious where this conversation will take us. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure to grab the link and share it with just one other person today. That way you'll help to grow the Service Design Show community and help me to invite more interesting guests like Simon. For now, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video over here. Bye.